mean by that? So the problem is uh, this one. One of you has to work. Where'd it go? Oh, yeah. So 25. Okay, so that's all I tell you. Just by itself, can somebody interpret what this means? What, what was done? What fundamentally was, was done? What's, what, what's happening here? Am I multiplying things? What am I doing? Dividing. What am I dividing? What by what? C divided by 25, correct? Right? So you don't know what C is. You don't know what B is. We all know R is remainder, right? So R is not another variable, just remainder. Everybody with me? But I, can, I know that was the problem that somebody got. They just don't know what C was. They're like, I had to divide something by 25. You with me? Okay. So what does this mean? Sure. So let's do it. Uh, so here's where you could take some concrete numbers. And they don't even have to relate to the, it just has to be a problem like this. So create a division problem where there would be a remainder. Can somebody do that for me? Say, say again. I'll just make it like a little bit bigger number, just slightly bigger numbers. Uh, 12 divided by 5. Okay. Uh, all right, sure. We'll do it. Okay. That'll work. It would have worked too, but all right. Uh, so if you start to do this long division, so in, in this case, what is 12 acting as from the problem we're working with? 12 is acting like C, correct? You guys with me? Okay, so 5 goes into 12 twice with how many left over? 2. All right, so a little bit bad we have a repeat, but so my question on this problem is um, what is 25 times B? So 25 times B, that's what I want to know, correct? That's what I want to know. I want to know what that is. The equivalent question here would be, what is 5 times 2? What is 5 times 2? Holy shit, but how does it relate to the other stuff? Where's 10 come from? <clears throat> so 5 goes into 12 twice. Why is, the re why is there a remainder? Why is there a remainder? When it why doesn't it go in evenly? Because 12 has 2 extra, correct? Therefore, 5 times 2 is equal to 12 minus the remainder. So another way to look at a remainder is if only the original number that I was dividing into was that much smaller, I, it would have went in evenly. So where do you see that? So for example, 8 goes into 80, correct? That goes in beautifully evenly, correct? That's 10. So how, 8 goes into 81. 10. Remainder 1. What does this mean? 8 times 10 is equal to 81 minus 1. Let me stop for a minute. So I, one thing I want you to understand is, what is it you're kind of like... Not really allowed is not the right word. What is it, but I'm gonna use it anyway. What are you allowed to use to kind of like investigate a problem? So one thing you can do is, and I showed you this back when we were doing word problems, plug numbers in place of the stuff you don't know and just kind of see what your brain does or see what kind of makes sense. And then go back to the weird thing that has all the variables in it, right? So if five times two is 12 minus two and eight times 10, is 81 minus 1, what's 25 times B? C minus 22. I lock it. Another kind of way to look at this that might be a little more uh, straightforward, because I was kind of going straight for the, the answer. 
8 times 10 plus 1 is 81, correct? 5 times 2 plus 2 is 12. So you could say 25 times B plus 22 is C, and then when you subtract 22, you figure out what 25 times B must be. All right, now, is this something you do every day? Is this something you've done a lot in your life? Kind of play with numbers and letters? No, it isn't. So it's not like an immediate thing, but does, does the work I did make sense? Does the interpretation make sense? So if I give you a problem and it kind and this is long division, you can tell it's long division. Why is it difficult? Because it's done, but there's letters in there. What? So, okay, let me give myself a concrete long division problem and sort of compare. I can see what's happening concretely. I can compare to the abstract problem. Does that make sense? And I understand from a student perspective, you might be thinking, am I, am I allowed to do that? <coughs> am I? Of course you are, right? It's sort of like related to the solve a simpler problem. So you're giving yourself values for the stuff you don't know. Does that make any sense maybe? No. Yeah. So you're not really looking for like, an actual answer you're just looking for. I, I need you to understand. That is the answer. 25 times B. 25 times whatever that number is, is that number minus 22. It just is. So on one level, I agree. It's an equation. But that is the answer. That is what 25 times B is. Here, let me do, um, watch this. What number does 25 go into nicely? Nice big number that 25 goes into evenly. 100, is that cool? What would I put inside so the remainder was 22? Because it goes into 100 evenly, yeah, yeah? So already you kind of understand the idea behind this. Whatever the remainder is, that's that much more than it should have been to, for that number to go in evenly. That's kind of like why this is what it is. So it would go in four times. So if C was 122 and B was four, then 25 times four would equal 122 minus 22. So that's, that's the idea concretely. Okay, all right. So I love it. This is happening a lot. I look out and I have a lot of students who could play. You must, you, if you don't, you should consider playing poker because you have this unreadable face. Like, no. Like, and I'm like, okay, I don't see anything either way, so I'm going to go for it. At least it's not this. Right? Okay, maybe. You know, like, don't talk about my face. All right, I'm sorry. All right. So that's a good question. That's one of the weirder questions on this practice test. So again, to remind you guys, you just got a quiz back, so you can ask questions to the quiz, you can ask questions from homework, uh, practice test, whatever you want to ask. What does this test go up to? 5.1, I like it. So it's chapter three, chapter four, and five, one. Yes. There you go. 20, that's, oh, yeah, this is, oh. this is such a cool little problem, and I know my adjectives don't sync with the adjectives you might pick for some of these problems, but uh, it's also a freaky problem. I need you to understand. The, these problems, and again, I don't know if I've had, I've had this discussion with a few classes, Cameron, I have had it with you, but some of my homework pushes you a bit. Says, okay, you feel comfortable here? All right, let me put you there. How do you feel? Uh, this might be one of those. Um, so let's see, 12, it says 12 is a factor of 10 squared minus two squared, and you can verify that, right? It also says, where'd it go? 27 is a factor of, uh, 
You can do it, Jeff. 20 squared minus 7 squared. And 84 is a factor of 80 squared minus 4 squared. Yeah. It's just interesting by itself. By itself, that's, and you can verify each of those, correct? How would you verify the first one? First statement up here. How would you verify this? Yeah, what is 10 squared minus 2 squared? What's 10 squared? Minus 2 squared. So 100 minus 4 is 96. Is that cool? Right? 100 minus 4, is that cool? 96 divided by 12 goes in evenly. Fill in the calculator. I mean, it doesn't work. You guys with me? You can verify each of those. And then I think it asks... Where'd go? There it is. Check to see whether these statements are correct. Using a variable, prove why this works in general. Okay. So, real quick, can you guys, it, it's very clear. Where did 12 come from? How's 12 related to these numbers? How's 27 related to these numbers? How's 84 related to these numbers? Sure. How do you get 12 from these numbers? 10 plus, 10 plus 2. How do you get 27 from these numbers? 20 is, I like it. So I, you're kind of saying it's broken into the 10s place and the, and the 1s place, right? So for example, let's kind of create our own. Didn't ask us to, we're going to create our own. So how would I kind of set up one for 36? Is a factor of? All right. So we're looking at the book, we're like, okay, book, I'm on to you. You pick the three that work. I'm going to make one myself. Nah, I'm going to prove you wrong, right? Or you don't have to be like that. But what is 30 squared? That could be so much worse. I'm fine with that. What's 30 squared? What's 3 squared? 9. 10 times 10? 100, so 900, right? Okay. Three times three with a couple zeros. What's six squared? Okay, now we're getting a little bit. Yeah, I can deal with that. That's all right. 36, right? And then what's that? <coughs> no, you don't want me to answer, sorry. 864. Now, in order for it to follow the pattern, it's got to be a fact, 36 has got to be a factor of that. What's 864 divided by 36? Sorry. We could just have a dance party. I didn't really order this, but what the hell? Uh, sorry? It goes in evenly, correct? Okay. You guys all with me? Now, that's the easy part, is verification is definitely easy. You just do it and then divide and see that it goes in evenly. Even creating your own thing, because the pattern is very easy to see, correct? Are you guys with me? Okay. But now I've got to use a variable. So how many variables should I use, really? What do you think? And, 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 and another thing, real quick. Does it have to be, does this first one have to be a whole number? Let's investigate that real quick, right? Because you, according to what they put down, it looks as if this first number has to be a whole number. Do you guys agree with me? So watch this. I'm going to take their first one, 12. And let me investigate. What if I do 8 squared minus 4 squared? Isn't 8 plus 4 12? Just like 10 plus 2 is 12, correct? You guys agree? You guys see what I'm doing? I'm kind of, again, I'm going a little bit beyond what they ask. And you're all like, don't. But this is the relatively easy part still. We haven't brought the variables in yet. What is 8 squared? 64. And what's 4 squared? 16. What's 64 minus 16? Forty-eight. 48. All right. Is 48 divisible by 12? Oh, shit. All right. You guys with me? So it seems like it might be a broader uh, general pattern, right? 
And again, could you live your life and not know this is existed? Oh shit, there's a ton of shit you do in college that you can live your entire life and not know. So I don't care. The idea with this one is just furthering your number sets, just playing with numbers, see what you're allowed to do. So let me come back to my question I asked a minute ago. How many variables do I need to set up? So again, I've got this number, and that number is the what of those two numbers? No, no, no. 10 and 2. What do I do with them to make 12? Add them. 20 and 7, I add them to get 27. 80 and 4, I add them to get 84. So can anyone see how many variables I need then? In order to get 12, what did I have to know? This one and this one, correct? All right. So instead of putting a 10 there, what can I put there instead that represents any number? Sure. You could use X and Y, A and B. You could use happy face and box. It doesn't matter. Um, it's a new cartoon. Happy face and box. So I can do A squared minus B squared. And we're saying that what would have to be a factor of this? No, 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 no. If that's A and that's B, how do I always get this number? I don't need three variables. A plus B. So if A, I get this number, then A plus B is a factor. That's the claim, right? That's how you use variables to capture what's going on. Because you say to yourself, what could I change in this problem? You could change this number. But this number is dependent on those two, and you could change those two numbers. So it's really these guys that I want to give name, uh, general names to, and then I can create this guy. So I only need two variables. Now, there's not a ton of algebra in here, but here's one place that you see some algebra. Does anyone remember, since we're talking about factors, how do I factor this? How do you get a squared? What times what? A times a. A times a. A squared, right? Check. How do you get b squared? Holy shit. So b times b. B squared. Check. Do I want a middle term? Is there a middle term here? Is there a middle term here? I got an a squared. I got a b squared. I got nothing in the middle. You guys with me? So don't I want the middle term to cancel? So don't I want one of these to be minus and one of these to be plus? So when I do the middle term, I get minus AB plus AB. Cancels. Does anyone remember what that's called? What's the official name for this? What's the technical name for this? Starts with a D. I like it, but no. I took the road less traveled, and that made all the difference. Yes, difference, and these are? Squares. squares, so it's a difference of squares. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what the factors of this are? In fact, for example, uh, 12. Give me two factors of 12. Mm -hmm. Six times two, so six is a factor of 12, two is a factor of 12. What is a factor of a squared minus b squared? Give me one of them. What is a squared minus b squared? Isn't it a minus b times a plus b? Yes. Mm -hmm. Just like 12 is 6 times 2. So what is one factor of a squared minus b squared? A minus b and a plus b. So is a plus b a factor? Yes. Okay. That reaction tells me that made no sense. Damn it. What does it mean when I factor something? I end up with a piece times another piece, correct? Okay. This Is this the part that's sticking, that's not making sense, that part? Like, did we forget a factor, which is understandable if it's been a little while since we did algebra? Does that look slightly familiar? So a problem you would have seen back in the day would have been x squared minus 9. And you would do x plus 3, x minus 3. Does that look familiar at all to anybody? So that's all we did over here. Cut that in half, cut that in half, minus plus, right? So I always call it difference of squares to thank your favorite deity problem, right? Whatever your favorite deity is, you thank them for this problem because it's easy as shit. 
got everything in half, minus plus, done. Yes? And then I can see A minus B is a factor. So let's check. That's not what I asked for. What is A minus B for this one? A plus B is 12. What's A minus B for this one? What's A and B? Let me start there. What's A and B for this first one? What's A and B? 10 and 2. What's A minus B? 8. So 10 squared minus, nine, uh, minus 2 squared was 96, correct? Does 8 go into 96? Yes, it's 8 times 12, right? So they could have done, anyway, I'm not going to talk about what they could have done. That's enough for that problem, I think. So there's a chance at any moment a little bit of algebra could come in. This is one of them, right? So if you've forgotten your algebra, just, just ask. It's not a big deal. Yeah? Uh, what problem number was that? Oh, sorry. Uh, where was that? Oh, number 20 on 33B. One of the many levels of our homework. Yes? Yes. I got so many piles of stuff. Okay. Put you there. I lock it. You can go there. Go away. Um, number five. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. So what's the smallest set of whole numbers that contains the additive identity? What's the additive identity? What's the additive identity? Zero. Because when you hear the word identity, you think, what do I use the operation with that will maintain the original number's identity? So the multiplicative identity is the number I multiply by to not change the number. That, of course, is one. Additive identities, what do I add to not change the identity? Zero. So the set has to have at least zero and one in it. And it also needs to be closed under multiplication. So what is the smallest the set could be before I think about it being closed? Zero, zero and one. So now, is zero one, is that already closed under multiplication? If it is, I've got the answer. Is zero comma one closed? How do you check to see if it's closed under multiplication? You take two elements, and it could be repeating. So zero times zero is zero, that's in the set. Zero times one is zero, that's in the set. One times one is one, that's in the set. So is zero one closed? In fact, the minute I add one more element. I screw myself over, don't I? The minute I say, now you've got to put two in there. And there's a problem like this in the homework. If I did zero, one, two, how many more do you have to add? Now, this is an interesting question. What do you have to add to that to make it closed? Because do you agree? Zero, one, two. Everybody write down zero, one, two. Is that closed? Why is that? Let me say it like this. Why is that not closed under multiplication? Zero, one, two. Hell yeah. So this was good by itself. This was great. The problem's done. It has to have zero in it. It has to have one in it. And it's got to be the smallest set that's closed. Well, that's already closed. That's the smallest it could be. Because I've got to have these in it. The minute, now, just to push this a little bit further. If I add any number, like two, that is not closed. Does anyone know how many numbers I have to add to make it closed? Yes. Wouldn't you have to add all the even numbers? Well, not, not really. All the powers of two. All the powers of two, right? Does it make sense? Because I don't have three in there, so I don't have to bring anything. Why is this not closed? Because two times two is four, right? So then you go, okay, I'll add four. How's that? Yeah. Well, now four times four is... Well, oh, I'm sorry, 2 times 4 is 8, 4 times 4 is 16, so I've already, so now I need 8, I need 16, correct? But now 2 times 16 is 32, and 4 times 8 is 32, and 4 times 16 is 60, I mean, do you guys, so it is all the powers of 2 that you would need. There's a problem a little bit like that in the homework. By the way, just to make sure everybody's with me, I went further than that question wanted you to, is everybody with me? And I do tend to do that. And if that's a problem, oh well. <laughs> 
So we were done with that problem a minute ago, right? I have to have zero in it, I have to have one in it. The minute I try to put anything else in there, it becomes an infinitely long, I have to make it infinitely long to be closed. So I just don't, it's closed. Stop, right? Don't try to put anything else in there. So for example, if I put three in there, right? Just to make sure everybody gets it. What else has to be in there? What's three times three? Ah, oh, shit. Now I got, what's three times nine? Oh shit, I better, oh, what's nine times nine? Oh shit. So then you get all the powers of three. Okay, maybe. Why does zero and one nice? Because one just comes back to itself. The minute something bigger than one, it's gonna go higher than that. So that makes it open-ended, that direction. You're like, oh shit, does that make any sense? Okay. <coughs> um, all right, what else we got? So again, it could be from the quiz, the practice test, the homework, just generally like, I don't remember what this shit is. Yeah, I'm sorry, come up to your ride. Oh, later, I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah. Yes, okay. Yep. So everybody agree that that's an addition table, right? It's just got weird elements, but it is addition. So I'm not gonna recopy the whole table, but you know, it's got ABC, ABC. So I ask you from the table, figure out what, what was it? B plus five C, Jeff, you could do it, buddy. All right, what is the, if I just said what's B plus C, could everybody look at the table? What is just B plus C? Yeah, B plus C is B, I love it. In fact, let me ask a real quick question that I could ask on the test. What is the identity element? What does additive identity mean? When you operate using that with addition, it better maintain the number, it shouldn't change the number. So what is the thing I add and it stays the same? C, do you guys see that? A plus C is A, B plus C is B, C plus C is C, it stays the same. I didn't ask that question, but I could. Okay, um, God, I'm doing this a lot this morning. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> the weirdest part about this problem then is right here, do you agree? Well, what does five C mean? So addition is straight up addition. It's nothing, it's not a brain, it's not like a little tilde, it's not some weird ass operation, it's addition. So what does 5C mean? C plus C plus C plus C plus C. And this becomes very quick. What is C plus C? C plus C is C plus C is C. So what's 5C? C plus C is C plus C is C plus C is C plus C is C, so I get a C. Is that, that, I think that would be the weirdest part is the 5C, you're like, how the shit? So let me ask you this. Are there any elements in my set that are numerical? No. So your brain might, and let me, let me really trip you out. I think I've said something like this before. There is no five. I don't see any five here at all. I don't see a five here anywhere. What does that mean? I've got five Cs, right? Okay, maybe, maybe. And now it should be relatively easy. You guys already told me what B plus C was. B, and then B plus A. C, of course the answer is C. You can't get away from C. Uh -huh. Is that all right? Oh, I'm sorry. Real quick, uh, Brooke. Go ahead, Ryan. Actually, I have a question about the same problem, but um, what happens to the other C? Like, what do you do? Oh, 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 okay, okay. Look at your table. Can you see what B plus C is? What is B plus C? So I re this is B, and then I still have a plus A. Oh, okay. So I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Again, they're letters, we're not used to that, but it's just simplifying the same way we would if they were numbers. I'll replace that with what it is, and then I keep going. Good. 
Oh, is that the only question, Ryan? Yeah. You had a question earlier? Okay, good. Um, group three, question B, question 11. B and C. Um, oh, is that the one to find the values of x? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. They all know you like the problems, John. That one I especially like. Uh, let me talk about C first. I really enjoy C. So I'm going to do a problem sort of like C. Um, I think that's the same idea. No. Okay. Wait, is that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> this will kind of give it. Well, let me do this. So that's sort of like what C is, right? This looks weird as shit, right? And you're all like, I don't know what kind of algebra I can use to solve for X. So it's not an algebraic problem, really. You have to think about what, what this means. If I wanted to, what's the only way I can have four to a power times three to a power and rewrite it as 12 to something? That's, that's really the question. So if they're both to the first power, what's four times three? Holy shit. If they're both squared. So if I have one four and one three, I can make one 12, cool? So the way I like to look at this problem is I'm constructing 12s. If I have two fours and two threes, how many 12s can I make? Two, is that cool? I get 12 squared, is that is that all right? You guys see that? So really, watch, just to remind you guys, can you guys remember, remind me, um, what is x, y to the fifth, for example? What can I do there? What's being raised to the fifth? What's being raised to the fifth? x and y, so what's a way to rewrite this? x to the fifth. Are you guys cool with that? Real quick. I was about to say go with me, and you're all like, that's all we ever do, dude. Um, what is uh, 5 uh, x plus y? So what is that? How can you rewrite that? Say a plotter, sorry? See how the 5 distributes because coefficients are based on addition? See how the 5 distributes because exponents are based on multiplication? They're both. Distributive property. What does that have to do with this problem, Jeff? I don't know. Well, here, right here. Isn't this 4 times 3 squared, which is 12 squared? So in order to construct a certain number of 12s, I have to have the same number of 4s and 3s. So how many 3s do I have here? So how many 4s do I need? The same number. So if I have 5 4s and 5 3s, how many 12s can I make? Five, so x has to be five in order for that to make sense. Let me push this a little bit, is that cool? So I didn't do the exact problem, I know there's one more, but let me do one more thing. Um, could I simplify this somehow? Yeah, of course, I can make it 27. Let me just show you a weird little thing we could do. Do I have extra numbers? Do you see that? Do I have an extra number? What do I have an extra of? Four. And I have an extra four, correct? So if I wrote this like this, I can now construct three twelves times a four, right? You guys see that? So how did I know these had to be the same because it came out to be exactly a certain number of 12s. There was no extra shit at all. Do you guys see that? There's no extras. So I knew they had to have the exact same power. Okay, maybe. So there's nothing you can do to solve that. You actually have to just kind of like go, well, what's got to be true for this to work? Yeah, it was less algebraic and more just... There's so much in mathematics that you can call construction. You construct what you need. So here's like 
raw materials to make so many 12s, we'll I have to have the same amount of each to make so many 12s. Okay, now I can figure out what the exponent has to be. All right, I like it. Anything else? Yes. Oh, yeah. Brooke claims that because less than, and this is not Brooke, this is some other Brooke. Because less than an addition for whole numbers is a property. Oh, okay, okay. We got to first make sense of what she's saying. I should put this on the overhead instead of copy it down. So if you got your book, it's number 23 on page 123. That's kind of nice. Uh oh. Which one was it again, Brooke? Oh, there it is. All right, so Brooke claims that because less than an addition for whole numbers is a property, so too should less than and subtraction for whole numbers be. Now, this is a beautiful example. Can anyone understand what that even means? Just her first statement. Because less than and addition for whole numbers is a property, what does that mean? And by the way, it's a beautiful example of a student coming to ask me a question. They don't quite understand the concept, so when they put the question together, I have to go, okay, let me see, what would that be? What is it you're at? Do you guys kind of follow what I'm saying? So if it, it totally makes sense. If a student doesn't understand it, their questions probably won't quite match up with the idea. So it, that's something as a teacher, you're going to have to make, make that bridge. So does anyone have any clue what the hell that might mean? Less than an addition for whole numbers is a property. Any, any clue? Any guesses? Yes? Maybe she's saying a subtraction for less than? Well, no, that's the next part. Oh. So too should less than and subtraction. So let's just deal with the first part. Yes. Less than B. Yes. Then A plus C is less than B plus B. Good. Okay. That must be what it is. Mm -hmm. So that is a less than with addition. So that, that's a property that's true. That must be true. Now, I'm about to say something kind of funny. I, this problem's okay because it does say a very key phrase. Whole numbers. The minute you bring subtraction in, right? So for example, three is less than b. Not three is less. Than, three is less than five, correct? Yeah. Okay. Three, no, sorry. three plus one is less than five plus one. Yay, right? Uh, three plus seven is less than five plus seven, right? About three minus seven. Now, is that a true statement? Think about it. Is that a true statement? What do you get? What is 3 minus 7? And what's 5 minus 7? And what I always tell students, if you have any trouble with negatives, think about money. Which would you rather be? $4 in debt or $2 in debt? $2 in debt. So that's the bigger thing. So that's a true statement, right? Negative 4 is less than negative 2. You're more in the hole, correct? So that is a true statement. That's not what this thing is asking. What kind of numbers are we working with in this problem? Whole numbers. So what's immediately wrong when I bring subtraction in the possibility that I might get negatives, which are not whole numbers, correct? So there's a few levels. Part of me is okay with this problem, but another part of me doesn't like it. I don't like, I don't really love that we're doing a lot of stuff and we're pretending like Negative numbers don't exist yet, but a lot of when you teach students, you want to first start with physical stuff. 
and negative is not immediately clear how to do that physically. Later, you can do stuff like red chips mean positive and blue chips mean negative. You guys with me? But they need to have better cognitive ability when they get to the point because before that, they're just, I see five blocks. I see four blocks. I see five red chips. I see four blue chips. I got nine chips. What are you talking about one? You guys kind of with me? So it's not something you can do immediately. It's the idea of negative numbers, right? In fact, I did show you that thing, right? Yeah, I showed you that thing where negative numbers freaked civilizations out, right? So it shouldn't be surprising it'll freak a little person out. Okay, enough of that, John. So the whole point of this problem is the minute you bring subtraction in, it might not be a whole number anymore. So there's nothing wrong. This is true. Less than and subtraction works all freaking day. But if you're only using whole numbers, no, it'll bring up energy. It'll bring up negative numbers. Is that all right? Yes, yes. Oh, so I'll tell you this. Do not worry about 11. I discussed 11. I don't really have 11 memorized. I have to always go back and remember it, right? So right before I taught, I had to go back and go, okay, what was that again? So I'm never going to make you memorize something I don't. I have all the other ones memorized. Look at me. So you have to know, you know, basically four, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine. Okay, so we don't need seven. Seven, there is a rule, but it's even weirder than 11. Seven is such a weird little dude. It really is, right? Uh, I keep forgetting to do this. When, I, when you guys took the survey up on Canvas, if you did, did I ask you to pick a random number? You guys remember? And you're all like, dude, that's like months ago now. So normally I ask, did I even do a survey for you guys? Okay, good. So I normally ask students to do a survey, and I haven't looked at those, and that's my, the last time I looked. So if, I, if you ask any group of people to pick a random number from one to 10, most of them will pick seven. You guys understand that? Did, did anybody know that? So that's just the truth, that's just a fact. And there's only one time that I've given that survey in the, holy shit, 18 years that I've given that kind of survey, that seven was not the most choose number, and that was in 2008. Was it three? No. What's the lucky number? Uh, what's a lucky number? And uh, I'm pretty sure it's in China. Four. Four, okay. But isn't it also eight? All right, so we don't. So eight is a lucky number. So in 2008, there were a ton of people that got married on August 8th. <laughs> 888, eight, eight. are you with me? So that one semester, eight one out over seven. Every other semester in 18 years, seven has been the most. And then I have to find my smart asses that say like 1.3, because I just said pick a number from one to 10. So someone's like, pi. I'm like, I like you, you're okay. All right, all right, sorry, sorry. Um, anything else from homework stuff? Yes. Oh shit, I didn't check. My poor little camera is totally not looking at anything. Uh, 4.1 number. 4.1 number 40. And then B and D. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, okay. So, if you haven't tried this yet, if you have your calculator, because obviously, if I'm a student in this class and I see a question that says find the ones digit, I'm going to just freaking do 2 to the 10th. Right? So if you have a calculator, do 2 to the 10th. That one's an easy one, right? That's a gimme. What happens on the next problem? If I had to do 432 to the 10th. So 
this is a little bit of understanding that's required. Is that the ones digit there? No, right? In fact, what does that mean? Move the decimal 26 times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 17 zeros, right? Not even zeros necessarily, 17 more places. Let me be careful. You guys sitting with me? So I can't see the rest of the digits because the calculator screen is only so big. Right? I don't want a calculator that's like, okay, I'm ready. How the shit do I do this though? We've actually seen a problem like this somewhere else. I think it was chapter one. One thing we did in chapter one was look for a pattern. Yes? What I did was I just took the last digit, so the one digit in the actual number, so 436. Sure. And then I took All right, how are you sure that that works? And <laughs> you're like, it was a lot of hope, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying if you do that, you have to show me why that approach would work. And, and if you look at the other problems real quick, um, the other two problems, do you see how that's three to the sixth and that ends in three? So that does make sense. I didn't want to really give it away, but it does make sense that could be the idea, but you have to tease out why that's the idea. Does it make sense? So you can't just go, I think it's this. Next. <laughs> no. You have to show me why it would be that. You guys somewhere with me? So this is an example of a problem where you can actually get clues for the idea from the questions. Two, two to the tenth. Three three to the six so maybe there's a connection and that's why they asked me an easy one and then a hard one easy one and then a hard one maybe there's a connection right okay maybe so again you have to think how do i sort of investigate that how do i kind of show really quickly that that's going to be the way it is yeah so i didn't like Two ninety. Like, oh, here, yeah. Two ninety to the six, and then I kind of broke it up. So two ninety to the six, and then three to the six, and then. Yeah, but you got to be careful. Okay. So a couple things. Um, so if I'm looking at two ninety three to the six, you are not allowed to do something like this. Right? So that's what I'm concerned about is did you make it clear that's not what's happening? Right? And real quick, let me just say this. If I have some big ass number that ends in a three and I have another big ass number that ends in a three, when I multiply those, what's the number gonna end up with? What's the last digit gonna be? A nine, correct? That's the only thing that's gonna be in the ones place. You guys with me. And then if I multiply by that same big ass number that has a three at the end, what's the next number gonna end in? Seven. The two's gonna carry over to the next place. So in other words, only the ones place would be the ones place. Exactly. Right? Leftovers from the ones place affects the next place. There's no previous place to affect the ones place. So if that made any sense, that is how you explain what you did. But I do sometimes get students that are hopeful about this. That's not right. Even though you get the right answer, that's not the reason. Maybe, maybe, okay. So those of you who tried the practice test, besides the two that people asked me about, were the other ones okay? Uh, oh, okay, beautiful. That's another one that I was like, if nobody asked about that, then nobody looked at it. <laughs> uh, okay.
something's got to change. All right, so how do I read this statement? Six line X, Y. How do I read that statement? What does that symbol mean? Uh oh. No, because not two of them. We, this is the most recent thing. I, well, it's one of the most recent things. Yes. Divides. So if I say 6 divides 36, does that sound reasonable? If somebody else said 7 divides 36, what would you guys think about that? Does 7 divide 36? So in one sense you say, yeah, but is the answer pretty no? So when we say divides, we inherently mean divides evenly. Right? So 6 divides xy means whatever the hell xy is, if I divide by 6, I get a nice whole number. So that's what divide, that's what that symbol means, divides evenly. Right? Is that? So they give us that this is true. So we're given that this is true. We know this is true. Must six divide y? And I love it. Right now I can, I can just feel it out there going like, I don't know, man. <laughs> what do you do with x and y? It's bullshit. Think back to an earlier problem we did today. Are there things I don't know? Can you, for a minute, give yourself some numbers? Go. So I need X and Y. So what I need, this is the question, is this true? Don't make this true. Make this true. Can anybody give me an X and a Y that would result in a number that six divides into? Three and four. So this says six divides the number three times four, six divides 12. That's a true statement, correct? So effectively, what does this say? Six must divide one of the factors. Is that true? Does six divide three? Again, that means the six go into three evenly. No, right? That's why we had to invent freaking fractions, because it's like, uh-uh. Three is half of what it needs to be for six to go into it, so six goes into three at one half. Maybe. So right there, that's what's known as a counterexample. So a counterexample is a specific example that goes against what's supposed to happen. So this said, if this, must this be true? There's a counterexample? No. Now, could this be true? Shit, yeah. What's the simplest way to, to factor 12 and 1? <laughs> simplest way to factor 12 is 12 times 1. Does 6 divide 12? Sure. So is it possible this is true? Hell yeah. Must it be true? No. So whenever I ask a question like, given this... Uh, does this necessarily follow? Does it mean that this? You just have to find a counterexample, right? And if you can't find a counterexample, maybe it's true, and then you have to prove it. Oh shit, proving sucks. Counterexamples kick ass. What about number 12? Did you guys see what went wrong there? You guys remember how to do that? I mean, if you don't remember how to do it, then obviously you're like, ah, it looks good to me. What, can somebody just tell me what on number 12 they did wrong? Beautiful. So the last step is you go diagonally, right? Okay. I like it. Anybody remember what that's called? Lattice method, yeah, lattice method. Not the lettuce method, no, but the lattice method. I'll lock it. Yes? So that one, um, I thought that they, oh, wait, no. Okay. 
If I, let me see, did I ask a question like that? Oh, here we go, yeah, number six and seven, for example. Something that is okay, but it's good to stay away from. When I ask you a question like, a student did this, how would you explain that they're wrong? Don't do the problem. If a student comes to me and they say, I don't understand, I'm not gonna do the problem, right? Is that gonna help them? No. Do you guys understand? So again, I'm not going to take points out of the video, but just that's not what you want to immediately do if the student says, I did this. Does this look okay? And you're like, no, you do it like this. Okay, next student. All right. Um, so what I need from you, don't. All right, so when I ask you a question like, your student comes to you and says, and they say, I think this is true. And, and, and I'm like, and you know it's not true. What, what do you say, say to them? Don't just say, well, I would explain this, and then there you go. No, 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 no. You, how would you explain it, right? So I, I need you to go a little bit more in depth. Does that make, and not like crazy in depth, but you have to tell me something. How would you set up an example? What would you do? Um, okay. What, what concerns me is, uh, so for example, number six, there were a few people that, and I, when you're in a class like this and you're talking about not just the subject, but how to teach the subject, your brain disconnects sometimes and sort of like forgets the way because you're trying to think on two levels at once. So I get that. But if I see two times three times four, that is not six times eight, right? Yes. If I just said to you, What's two times three times four? How would you do it? Five times yeah, okay, you could do three times four and then times two. Well, that's how I put it there, Jeff, good. So I was really thinking like this in my head, but yeah. So you could do, three times four is 12 times two, you could do two times three and then multiply by four. So a student might say then, well then why did the two only go to the three? And here's what I would say. Two times three is six, correct? That's amazing, six times four is 24. Doesn't six have a two in it? Didn't that get applied to the four? Isn't the two in the mix, right? It didn't just go to the three, they both went to the four, right? You guys kind of with me? So one way, if I had a student that said, I think that's this, and that's 48, yay. I would say, how many twos do you see up here? How many twos are up there? One, right? I see one, two. So the only way you can make three double and four double is if you had two twos, correct? Okay, maybe, maybe. And then they say, well, what about this shit, Mr. Wong? What about that shit, math boy? Right? And of course, this is where I'd say, well, that means three plus four plus three plus four. So you do end up with two of them in that case, right? Okay, maybe. So, it, all right. So I saw a few people, it wasn't a question about you had trouble with it's why you actually said that this was true. So I really, really want to make sure that, I mean, when you get stuck in the idea of explaining, you might forget, no, 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 it's not how that works. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. Here, before I forget real quick. Anybody else not get their quiz back? Okay. How you guys doing? Are you guys doing okay? You guys doing okay? Are you concerned about this test? And you're like, yeah, it's a math test. What do you want? So, I mean, I think everybody got that like example uh, notes from like, I think it was section 3132, I gave you like an example way to collect the notes there. You remember that? I don't know if you guys remember that, but I gave you a sheet and it had basically the way that I would uh, kind of rewrite my notes for section 31 and 32. So what I always did when I was in a class is I would find the main concepts and make sure I make a list of them all and go, okay, do I know what that means? Let me find a problem that uses it, 
Can I do it? Okay, check. And then I keep going. You guys kind of with me? I have no idea how you guys study. Now, what's really interesting to me is as a college teacher, I normally spend very little time on uh, note-taking and such. One big reason is I don't have time. <laughs> but in some of our courses, they're called support courses, we do build in stuff like uh, how do you get ready for a test? How do you take notes? How do you time manage, right? It's because we created a whole separate little side support course attached to a course. So then we have time to do it. Um, you guys are going, uh, one huge thing you're going to be doing with your students, depending on how young or whatever they are, but almost across the board is showing them how to take notes, showing them how to organize their stuff, showing them, right? Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Just want to throw that out. Um, anything else? Is there a lever on the yeah, maybe. Let's see. Okay, that's one I could do. I like it. Um, what does compensation mean in terms of this stuff? Which piece of the screams out that compensation would work well? There's a number that's almost a great number for the operation. Hmm? Well, sort of, but you can't really get a factor and leave 200, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's compensation mean? In the real world, what's compensation mean? How do you get compensated normally? It's, you go work and somebody gets, takes some of the money from their account and gives it to you, correct? So you go mow somebody's lawn, they take money from them, and they give it to you, correct? So here, if I, if I take a factor of two, what's left? So then I can give that factor of two to that. That's compensation. And now, of course, that's easy. Multiplication by 10 kicks so much ass because their number system is based on 10. <coughs> so that's multiplicative compensation. Additive compensation would be if I have like I don't know, 48 plus 53, I can take two away from this dude, give it to this guy, and then that's nice, right? That's additive compensation, right? Same idea. One piece gives up something and gives it to the other piece using the operation that's present, or else it wouldn't really jive. I'm sorry, somebody had a hand up, I think, or am I? It was me for okay. just a split second, but I figured it out. Okay, I love it. That's my keep talking and see if it resolves itself approach to teaching. Yes? What's the difference between compensation and compatibility? Mm. Compensation is kind of related to compatible numbers. Very often you're trying to create a compatible number through compensation. So compatible numbers are just two numbers that go together well and make a nice number. It's like um, obviously eight and two. Compatible, four and 25, because they multiply by 100, right? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. That is related to compensation, but compensation isn't just sitting there looking at the numbers it was given, it's actively trying to make it something nice. Does that, does that make sense? So if I ask you to do um, four times, you know where I'm going, it's 11 times 25, are you gonna do it straight across? Because what's present already? Two numbers that are Compatible. So I'm going to do these first. Compensation is, I don't see any compatible numbers, but I do see if I take this away, it makes it easier. It's, it's kind of related. I can sometimes end up with compatible numbers, but I don't need to. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Okay. Yes. So 212 divided by 2 is 106. Yes. Will a Will the answer always be the same if you split it up like that? Like, like if it's not that equation. Like if oh, it's equation, obviously, it still... obviously, if this was like uh, 211 times 5, now I'm a little screwed. Because 211 is not divisible by 2. I can't easily use compensation here, right? Got it, okay. So if one thing doesn't have what the other thing needs, then you can't really use compensation. So it's like, 
if I had to be paid in euros for some reason, and all you got is dollars, then we, you know, it's not compatible. I can't, no, can't use them. Can't, the compensation you're offering is not what I need, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, all right. What does composite numbers mean? That's the one, right, the 19? Okay. What are composite numbers? <laughs> you know, like, I'm asking you, dude. Um, they're the opposite of prime numbers in a way. That they, yeah, so prime numbers can only be written, at, can only be factorized as what? One times itself, so like 17. It can only be broken down in terms of whole numbers as one times 17. So composite numbers, I love this are composed of more than just one and seven. That's why we call them composite. Um, so all I'm asking there is, obviously the answer can't be uh, 17 plus two, because 17 is not composite, right? Mm -hmm. So you just gotta th think for a second, okay, how can I break 19 up using summation where I get two numbers that are composite that aren't prime? Yeah. So I like that kind of problem because you can kind of make a list, right? You can go back to your old strategies, right? Uh, but it's two things at once. I need you to break 19 up, but I need them to be composite. So you're breaking and then checking, breaking and then checking. That's one way to do it. I don't know if anybody did it a different way. Okay, no. Yes. Fifteen. Oh, all right. Um, so this is a beautiful example of a big freaking number. <laughs> this one, right? Fifty-one seventy-five. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly the kind of problem where knowing your divisibility rules comes into play. Now, now this one, you already know this divisibility. What obviously goes into fifty-one seventy-five? And nowhere in there did it say you can't use a calculator, so you just take 5175 divided by 5, and you get something or other, right? So you get 1035, I think. Is that right? So then what goes into this number? Oh, no. Holy shit! And then you just keep going, right? And when I made prime factor trees, we circled when we got a prime number, right? So it looked like a prime tree with little decorations on it, little ornaments. Yeah. First number is how many times, or you're finding it by five, and the second one is how many times five is going to that? Exactly. So this times this is this. Okay. So every level, you should be able to multiply back up to get there. Yeah. And how many levels should you take? Yeah. It does, however many it takes. You got to get all the way down to its DNA, all the way down until you get nothing but prime numbers, right? Composite numbers are numbers that can be broken up as the product of two whole numbers that aren't just one times itself. So 17 is not a composite number because you can only break it down as one times 17 in terms of whole numbers, right? You with me? 16, I can break that sucker down as one times 16, two times eight, four times four, right? So that is a composite number because it's composed of more than just one times the number. Cool. Yes? Going back to 15, when you divide 1035, you get 207. All right. Five, five. Now, you have to use another divisibility rule. Because 5 doesn't work anymore, right? right? What's 2 plus 0 plus 7? Okay. So, so what goes in? Yeah, see? Those divisibility rules, if you, if you really are sure you never heard of them before I told you, you should be a little angry. You should be like, Come on, fellow humans, tell me some shit, <laughs> right? So this is the things that humans figured out, we should tell you. I just feel like the focus in high school and before has become more calculator centered. If anyone's gone through high school recently, can you, well, you wouldn't know, because you're like, I wasn't going through high school before I went through high school, Jeff, but in my day, we didn't have as, use as calculators as much, but I think 
the general uh, rules have sort of allowed more calculator usage, which has made any memorization, any understanding of stuff like the, vis the visibility rules appear as if it's just unnecessary. And I'm hopeful that some of you guys are like, shit, yeah, I don't wanna know this. I would love to have known this. It's very useful to be able to tell ahead of time if something's gonna be divisible by something else. Okay, yes? Yeah, so when I just say find the range for it, that's a low estimate, high estimate. That's the first example we looked at. Just force round down and force round up both numbers, right? Yeah. And then we sort of improved on that a few different ways. Yeah. Uh, question on the test, are we doing calculators? Uh, yes. Yeah, I don't see why not, to be honest. Yeah. You will have calculators, but the thing to be careful about is you always have to show work, right? I need, so I used to have a shirt that said show work. I haven't been able to find it, so I'm trying to buy another one because it's so necessary to just point at my shirt. Yeah. Yes? I need that and the shirt that says it's on the syllabus. Oh, okay, okay. So when I'm adding in base seven, that one, right? Uh, uh, all right. So these are easy. Yes? So where things get tricky, so zero plus zero, uh, yeah, there, Jeff. Zero plus one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. Where it gets tricky, one plus one is two, one plus two is three, one plus three is four, one plus four is five, one plus five is six, one plus six is? Yeah, good, one plus six is 10. And I always want like, my dean or somebody pop their head in. Hey Jeff, what'd you just say? <laughs> is everybody cool with that? Now in our base, one plus six is seven, but we are in base seven, so one plus six is 10. Is that cool? Cool. Okay. And then, of course, the great thing is the minute you get one here, you get it there because it is commutative. It's just a different base. It does still carry the commutative property. So, whatever this is, it's the same here. Three, four, five, six, ten. So then, when I go um, past it, so here I got four, five, six, ten, eleven. Yes, cool, because I just keep adding one. So, it's just like our base. We get to nine, the next thing is 10, and I still keep adding one after that. Well, you get to the base is 10, and you still keep adding one after it. Is that all right? And then I ask you, once you get this sucker filled out, nah. so with what I've got up here, what is 10 base seven minus, uh, you could do it, Jeff. Yeah, two base seven. Does anyone know how to look at that or how to get that? Here's a result of 10, yes? If I take, so why did I pick right there? Because there's a 10 there, yes? But I, don't I want to take two away? So is it 10 minus two base seven? Isn't that saying two base seven plus what is 10 base seven? That's the missing add and approach to subtraction, right? So what do I add to two base seven to get 10 base seven? Five base seven. So once you get this sucker completely filled out, you can answer any freaking question I ask you over here just by kind of looking at the chart. Is that all right? Yes. I have a question. So can you also use like the takeaway approach where you start with the 10 and then you go? Oh, and count two. back. Yeah. Count back? Sure. Yeah. So you go 10, what's one below that? Then six. Six and then, six, five. And then five. Beautiful. I love it. But I mean, if, you've are, if I ask you to construct this first, there's no need to do that. Right? If I didn't ask you to construct this, I would do it that way. But if I already got this sucker, I can just look at it and get the answers, right? I've already done a lot of work, yeah. So this is really, when you construct this and they ask questions like this, that's the missing add-end approach. You're just filling in the missing, what does this need to add to to become 10? That's the question, and you know what it is because you just look at your chart you made. But you know, just make sure you, nothing wrong with that, it's beautiful. It's exactly how you would teach a kid when it first did. They would count back, right? And we saw that in one of the videos. Count back. I don't know if you guys remember. But... Okay. Well, it's 3.30.
curious if you guys believe me when I say I brought nothing. So it's based on mm -hmm. what you need to act. And anytime, don't feel like, I'm not going to take your name down if you leave, because I mean, if you feel completely ready for the test, you can leave anytime you want to. What else we got? Anything else in the test, on the practice test that looked weird? Is there anything else you guys haven't asked that I was curious? Um, yeah, number 10 is about compatible numbers, right? Oh, go ahead, Brian. Uh, number, number eight. Eight, all right. What does expanded form mean when I talk about exponents? So like if I wanna write seven to the fifth out, an expanded form. What do you think that means? Yeah. Seven times seven. So thankfully, I'm not going to give you a problem like x to the 800. <laughs> what do you mean expanded form? Right. So I mean, whatever the base is. So in this case, the base is this. And was it a fifth power? Mm -hmm. So then, what's repeated five times? Three b, three b. So I didn't ask you to do it, I didn't ask you to multiply it out, I just want expanded form, that's all that is. Yeah? Can you do four? That's the one I can't do. No, I'm joking. What? <laughs> oh, four! Uh, oh, that's right, you came in, I think we did it right before you got here, but... I can just look at the video. Okay. Well, if nobody's got a question, we can do it again, so we'll see. Yes, right. Or, yeah, sorry, we'll come back. Uh, uh, oh, okay, beautiful. So your garden's got a whole, this is the weirdest thing in the world. This is a very strange form of, uh, of absent-mindedness. So your rectangular garden has whole number dimensions and an area of 72 square feet. However, you have forgotten the actual dimensions, but somehow you remember that they're whole number dimensions that come out to be 72 square feet. Okay. Brains are weird things. Um, I know all too well. If you want to fence the garden, what lengths of fence might you need? Okay, so can somebody give me one? If I know the area is 72 square feet, if I did not say they had to be whole numbers, there's an infinite number of possibilities. There's an infinite number of numbers that multiply by 72. If I say that they must be whole number dimensions, can anyone give me just one thing that would end up with that area? One set of dimensions. Eight and nine. Okay, so if my garden was... 8 by 9. In that specific case, how much total fencing would I need? So I always get a student tell me 17, but then you, you only went this far. So the little monsters are going to come in and eat all my carrots or whatever the hell, right? Hmm? 35. No? That's all right. 30. Average those. 34, right? So whatever this is, the funny thing is, once you get factors that work, do you see how you just double one and double the other one to get how much fencing you would need? Don't I have two eights and two nines? Two eights and two nines, right? So there's two levels to this. Make a list of all the factors of 72 using whole numbers and then figure out what the perimeter would be for each. So one extreme, what's the most extreme way to factor 72? 72 and 1. So that would be a garden that looks like this. Right? More than likely, that's not, especially here, this is just me, I can't draw it. Um, it's more than likely not this. I just have one carrot, one carrot, one carrot. Again, you would double this because I got two 72s and two 1s. You guys sort of with me? A pro. A, a very interesting thing that comes out of this problem is you can determine what's the most efficient way to use whole number dimensions to get an area of 72. How much, how much uh, fencing would I need here? Double 72 plus double one. I need 146, I think it was feet, yeah. Feet of fencing, are you guys with me? Here, I would need 16 plus 18. 34 feet of fencing. Oh, is that what the 34 was? I'm sorry. Or no, uh, 34 is right. You guys with me? So isn't that, that gives me the same area to work with, 
but I need a lot less fencing to accomplish it, correct? So for example, have you guys ever, all right, I'm a Georgia boy. I don't know if you guys realize this. My, my accent's way buried deep. If I go back to Georgia, it starts to come back out. But you, in Georgia, did you know we're known for peanuts, right? So you see these silos in Georgia, and they're circular. So anything like grain or anything that can fill in, it will be a circular container. Why? Because it uses the least amount of material to construct to hold the most stuff. So do you see how this the same as this? Both of these areas are 72 feet squared. You guys agree with me? They're both 72 square feet. This one accomplishes it using much less materials, correct? So in real reality, for things that can really fill stuff in, a circle, so like a cylinder that's built off of circles would be the best shape. If I have boxes, obviously a big freaking rectangular shape would be better. But if I have little kernels, corn or peanuts or whatever, circular. That was all extra. <laughs> that was all, whatever, man. Can I talk about peanuts? Great. Did somebody have my hand up? I thought. Yes. Um, could you you do another question with me? Oh, okay. What is required for something to be divisible by two? I'll work my way up. What do you need for something to be divisible by two? What am I drinking? I think it's just tea. It's gotta be an even number, correct? What does it take in order for something to be divisible by three? They have to add up to be a multiple of three. So, of course, by Thursday, you're going to have all this stuff memorized. Because it's right. So, what do you think has to be true for it to be divisible by six? Six, of course, is made of two and three. So, the number not only has to be even, the digits also have to add up to be a multiple of three. So, as long as that's true, then that number is divisible by six because it's divisible by two and three. You guys need to Maybe? Okay. So, you know, for example, if I wanted to know if something was divisible by 12, what would it take? Break 12 up. Three times four, yes? Right? So the digits would have to add up to be a multiple of three, and the last two digits would have to be divisible by four. If that was both true, it's divisible by 12. Now, where you have to be careful is, I can't do something like eight would mean it has to be even and the last two are divisible by four because two and four both go into eight. So here's a nifty thing. This is a side note. All this really is a side note. Um, there's an idea of something called relatively prime. So is six prime? No. But do six... You could do it, Jeff. Do six and 25 share any factors? 25 is not prime, six is not prime, right? Six and 25, they are relatively prime to each other. They, neither one has is something that the other one has. So that's an interesting idea. So divisibility by six, because two and three are relatively prime, it just has to meet both of those rules at the same time. I can't use eight with two and four because two and four are not relatively prime. Is that, that's more than you have to know, I'm sorry. But it's just a neat idea, this idea of relatively prime, yeah. I just need a little bit of clarification because it says without dividing show that big number ending in eight is divisible by six. But as far as I just understood, six is, that's not going to be, but the way I'm reading it, it just sounds like it for sure is divisible. Oh, it has to be, okay. Two things to be divisible by six. So it's got to be divisible by two and by three, correct? Right. What's the rule for two? The number's got to be even. even. Is it even? Yes. What's the rule for three? Has to add to have three. All the digits have to add to be a multiple of three. So add up all the digits. Okay. I don't know if anybody's surviving that. Oh, so, we so it's really funny. Sometimes you guys have a poker face, and sometimes your face says everything. Right? So I look at something like, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Damn bad. All right. So what did you get? Did you have a lot? 36. 36, okay, thank God. Okay.
because I was like, did I do that right? Okay. So here, let me go ahead and give you guys the answer key so you can make sure I got everything right. You never know. Okay. I like to say an average name like a 97 on my answer keys. Everybody, uh, does everybody know where I am like half an hour before class starts? I'm in my office, yeah, so it's right there. If there wasn't a class in here, I would be in here because I kind of like to be in the class, but there's a class in here, so my office is 100 107, it's right there. So I'm just sitting in there half an hour before class starts, right? So you can come by there. I'm in there before that, by the way. You can just knock on the door if it's locked. And then if I open it and I say, I'm too busy, you know, that's, but if I open it, I say, come on in. You guys kind of see what I'm saying? So you do have the capability of getting one-on-one -on -one help from me. And if you're like, I get enough of you, then you've got at least Mark in the Mass Study Center, right? To help you out, yeah. Where are we at? Sorry. 115 on the test. You want us to put it back? Oh, no. I, that was just an extra thing I did. Okay. So if you just put. Back. Yeah, even if you just circle them, I'll know what you mean. But you at least put 5 times 5 times 3 times 3 times 23. Yeah. Yep. Um, By the way, real quick, I wanted to mention this. This week is Undocumented Student Week. So I've got my little shirt on, but uh, GrowSpawn's website does not list the events that are happening. I don't know if you guys got emails about this week, maybe not. I don't know, GrowSpawn's done a really poor job with their website, but anyway, as teachers in the future, this could be one level of thing you have to work with your students about. This could, could be, this could come up for you. So. Yeah, you need to be aware of all the difficult, all the situations your students could be in that could affect their being present. Anyway, okay. so if anyone still has questions, I'm still here, but otherwise, if you're ready, you can head out. Oh, um, <clears throat> yeah, this is perfect. So five threes, <clears throat> and then another seven threes. And then you said the problem is just there's really okay. So that if you were just one one more step and said so therefore you would have so many threes instead of twenty five nines, right? Is the only right the number of threes down? Yeah, just to complete the idea that you kind of build it. So you're building an idea here, but I want to see it completed, right? For the student. Yeah. Okay, and then I just want you to go and explain each step each step. Well, one. explain the the how it relates to this problem. So don't just say, I would use PEMDAS. Say, in this problem, I would explain that you have to do this and this, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see, therefore the number 10 does not exist in base nine. Oh, okay. She's not correct. Okay, so don't just stop the, the... Oh, I didn't even catch this at first. So it's not the number 10. The number 10 doesn't even exist in base 10. Mm -hmm. There's no number 10 in base 10, yeah. right? There's no digit 10. <clears throat> but what I wanted to see here was sort of like, this was a quiz right after we talked about um, uh, adding to get the base. So if you do one base nine plus eight base nine, that would be 10 base nine, right? Because one plus eight is nine, so in base nine that's 10, correct? Mm -hmm. So then, that would be a way to explain this. One base nine plus eight plus nine would be 10 base nine. So two would be an extra one. So that should become 11 base nine, right? Oh, okay, and okay. for this one, should I just rewrite it using, write the numbers? Uh, oh, here's the problem. No, no, no. How many are supposed to be here? 
three, right? Mm -hmm. So you have 20. Oh, I did an extra one. Oh, yeah, you did an extra oh. call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Do you want me to stop this? Oh, sure. That was a